What does it mean uh, to uh, begin with the end in mind? Um, it's kind of it kind of goes back to that map we were we had of Singapore. If you remember that uh, analogy, we have a map from Singapore, and uh, we somebody's given it to us that it's the map to KL, and we're lost in KL trying to use a map to Singapore. A little bit of that, or it's just being in KL, KL without any map at all, and you have no idea where you're going. Uh, so. It's going to take you a long time to get there on that basis. Uh, these are the videos we'll watch this week. Uh, we just watched the music video, and probably in class we'll watch Zig Ziglar. We'll watch uh, the first Tony Robbins, and we'll watch um, most of the second Tony Robbins about visualization, but uh, probably enough that you don't need to watch the rest if you don't want to, but if you like what you're hearing, you might want to. So out of class, you'll have the basically the, the three Stephen Coveys, um, and so that's not going to add up to all that much. Oh, and also the the one, the uh, Isaiah Hankel, 16 minutes. So, um, you know, altogether you're going to have uh, 19, you know, like 35 minutes worth of video. Not that big a deal. So you do have time within your hour to watch the rest of the Tony Robbins that we won't get to today um, in class. Um, and He's a very good presenter, has some very good ideas, and you'll like the first part that we will watch in class, but we'll just run out of time. That'll be the last thing we do. Our character is basically a composite of our habits because they are consistent, often unconscious patterns. They constantly, daily express our character. And so the idea here, and this is kind of an overview again, going back to the beginning, of why Dr. Covey called it the seven habits of highly effective people, not the seven principles. Uh, seven habits is that if you really want to change your life, you change in such a way that you start doing things uh, without any thinking about them. Uh, because that's if we have to think about every life choice we make, uh, well, we can't. Uh, and so, and especially things that are so important as beginning with the end in mind, always ha having a goal, uh, a long-term goal, and knowing exactly what we want to accomplish in life, if we, if we, you know, have, we make up that long-term goal once and then we forget about it, it's not doing as much good. So we have to make it part of us so that we know where we're headed uh, all the time. Uh, so again, uh, he, he, he thinks that basically our very character, is he a good person, a bad person? is really the, the sum of our habits. What do we habitually do when we don't think about it? And, and then sometimes we basically conclude that guy's a bad person, that person's a good person. Uh, and it's mostly, like I say, a composite of their habits. Whatever habits they've developed, uh, whether it is to be inconsiderate of other people, always uh, look for the worst in other people, always taking advantage of other people, those people we tend to say, those are bad people. Uh, if they're always being nice to everybody, they're thinking the best of everybody, they don't, you know, knife people in the back and so forth, that is a composite of all their good habits. Uh, they don't have to think about being a nice person. They are a nice person. And that person over there doesn't have to think about being a bad person. He's just a bad person in the sense that he's developed habits that make it difficult to be around him, uh, makes it even maybe some cases dangerous to be around him. Um, dangerous uh, because he attracts other people like him, dangerous because you can't trust him, uh, whatever. So again, when we talk about character uh, at the kind of the end of our life, if there's somebody judging us up there, that will be, our character will be the sum of our habits. Um, and so it's important to understand that. And, and so thus we have seven habits to think about that can make us better people and make us happier and make us more successful all at the same time. Uh, again, and the, the first habit was, what was the first habit? Be proactive. And so that again, the ultimate freedom is the right and power to decide how anybody, how anybody anything outside ourselves will affect us. That's being proactive. That's the decision that we, or the habit we create where we take responsibility for our lives and no matter what our parents did to us, no matter what our boss did to us, no matter uh, how bad the economy, no matter whatever excuse we might have, we 
accept responsibility for our destiny. And we you know, fight through the difficulties. We will all have difficulties. That's part of life. Uh, if it, there's nobody who doesn't have difficulties. If, uh, in fact, you know, we were talk, we talked about it before. It's hard for us to wrap our brain around it. But I think some of the people who have the greatest difficulties in what we're talking about are people who are highly successful in business uh, or in whatever career they have. In other words, they're rich and they're famous. And those are the people committing suicide in Hollywood or whatever. They're people who don't who, who achieve what we all dream to achieve, and they realize this isn't happiness. This is the facade of happiness. It's not happiness. And so uh, sometimes I really, it, like I said, it's kind of hard to wrap your brain around it. But some of the people who have to face the biggest challenges in life in developing their character and becoming good people and and being happy are those who now have everything they want financially and in those in that realm, uh, temporally, if you want to say things in this world that we think we really want, they have it. And now they're miserable still. Now they don't have good relationships. Now they don't um, have good character necessarily and so forth. Uh, remember this name, Peter Drucker. Peter Drucker was one of the early uh, pioneers, you might say, of business management. And so thus this uh, famous magazine in America, Business Week, said the man who invented management. Uh, he's, uh, I mean, that's probably an exaggeration, but he, he was extremely influential, enough so that after World War II, uh, while you know, Japan was devastated by, by the war, uh, their economy had collapsed. Uh, they were, of course, had two uh, nuclear bombs dropped on them. Uh, just a few little problems like that. A lot of the men had died. Um, they asked Peter Drucker to come help them figure out how to reestablish their economy. And so, yes, they did get some help from America as far as loans and stuff like that to rebuild. Uh, but they needed the ideas. What do we do to succeed? We, we have this terrible economy now. We're... Uh, you know, what do we do? And Peter Drucker was a the man they called on to help them reestablish. And obviously we see how successful they were. They have some problems now with demographics that their older people, including most of their engineers are retiring and their younger people don't want to be engineers anymore. They don't want to be mathematicians or scientists. And so they are facing some difficult times because they also are not particularly inclined to have immigration. Uh, America has kind of the escape valve. Our, our young people also don't want to be mathematicians and engineers and, and uh, so forth, but people want to come to America and we let them in. And so we replace our retiring engineers with Japanese engineers or where, whatever engineers we want because they want to come to America. So that, that helps the economy keep going because of immigration and Japan doesn't like immigration, basically. They want to keep their, their culture uh, un uh, tarnished by outsiders. So they've got a problem uh, they're, they're facing. Anyway, one of the things that Peter Drucker said, the best way to predict your future is to create it. Again, that's a very proactive stance, is that we don't just sit back and uh, hope that things will turn out well, but we are the inventors uh, of our destiny. Um, we may be very busy. This is something that uh, that uh, uh, that our uh, author Stephen Covey uh, says uh, we may be very busy, we may be very efficient, but we will also be we will also be truly effective only when we begin with the end in mind. So being efficient and being effective are two different things. Um, this uh, perhaps could be exemplified by a story that Dr. Covey tells in his book. Uh, there's this, uh, I may have uh, may have mentioned it kind of in, in our day one for those that were here, but it's worth reiterating, I think, that it makes the point that there's this work crew, like I may have even said it last week, but anyway, bear with me if I did. And the work crew is out in a jungle building uh, a road through the jungle. And so they're working hard. They're chopping down trees. They're cutting the underbrush. They're smoothing the pathway. They're doing everything they can to make a perfect road. 
In other words, uh, you know, they and, and in fact, they they brought in some good equipment for it. So they're being very efficient. They're working really hard. Um, and then somebody climbs up on a tree and looks out over the horizon and shouts down, we're going in the wrong direction. And somebody down below says, yeah, but we're making progress. In other words, we're being efficient. We're, 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 doing, we're, we're making a lot of uh, headway in this uh, road, but they're not going to end up in the city where they want to go because they're going in the wrong direction. And so beginning with the end in mind is essential uh, or no matter how efficient you are, no matter how hard you work, no, how, no matter how positive attitude you have, uh, you're not going to end up where you want to go because you, have, you don't have the end in mind. You're building the, the road through the jungle without knowing where you're going. So it may be a beautiful road. And what? This, so what? A beautiful road to nowhere. Uh, so um, thus, we must uh, be, be, uh, have that goal. Uh, Peter Drucker, now a, an older picture of him, uh, says efficiency is doing right things. Effectiveness is doing the, no, excuse me, efficiency is doing things uh, right, and effectiveness is doing the right things. So, so in other words, again, they were building the road efficiently but they weren't doing the right thing. They weren't going the right direction. So efficient and effective are two things. And effective is leadership, is, is a leadership principle. You, you're only going to get where you want to go if you have a clear path, a clear map, if you would, to where, you, where it is you're going. And that's uh, being effective. And that is habit two. Uh, habit three is management. Is, is controlling your time, how to, how to manage yourself and manage others in an effective way. That, uh, that increases your efficiency. Uh, your, your leadership principle is beginning with the end in mind. That is uh, effectiveness. So uh, begin with the end in mind. The habit is based on the principle that all things are created twice. Now, maybe you don't necessarily create them twice yourself. Somebody else may have created the first one. The first one is kind of like in your head. Um, and then the second one's when you actually do it. So for you to take control of your own life, part of being proactive is making sure that you're making the first creation. In your mind, you are creating what you want to create. And so you can then effectively create it in reality. Um, again, even if, uh, I mean, there's, if you have somebody, if you allow somebody, and in some cases that's what a job is, you do allow somebody to do, make some decisions for you. Uh, but you need to decide to what extent should I, and can I, should I allow somebody else to decide what my end is in his mind, so to speak. So that's being an employee, right? But your life is still your own uh, and so you have to decide to what to what degree you allow somebody else to set the end and to what degree you set your own end um, and ultimately it's your if you delegate if you delegate it to somebody else understand you've made that decision but somebody is going to decide you know in their mind what that goal is that you're going to be achieving and then you go to do it so to the degree possible, and even if you're delegating it to your boss or whoever you're de delegating it to, understand that's your choice. It's your choice who to work for. Uh, so it's still your responsibility. Uh, so again, the, the first creation is mental. The second one is physical. Uh, the uh, beginning in mind, uh, it states that we decide the direction of our life. It also advocates the different roles we play in life and the need to maintain a balance between those roles. So not all, uh, you, you, you have various roles. And we've already talked about that somewhat, uh, somewhat what uh, uh, Dr. Christensen was talking about, how will you measure your life? And, and uh, you have a role of making a living, earning money, your professional goal, your professional life. 
you also have a personal life uh, that may involve a spouse and a family and things like that. You, you, have a, you are part of a community. So you have a role in your community. How do you make your community better? Or a, a country, how do you make your country better? We have a variety of roles and we can choose, I mean, well, it's up to us to decide to what degree do we, uh, do, do we want to accept the role in that, in, uh, in that entity. Uh, again, whether it's family, whether it's community, whether it's country, whether whatever it is, what is our role in that entity? Um, so as we think about the end in mind, it's not just about business. Uh, again, and that, that is the problem that Dr. Christensen was talking about, is that uh, a lot of people, particularly men, but not only men, uh, tend to identify themselves by their career. And, uh, and so they, they, they think they're doing, they tell themselves they're doing their, their family of, of this big service by working hard. I know that's what I tell myself. Um, but then if you neglect your family, you may even ultimately lose your family because you, you've, you've allowed yourself to be so focused on your career that, you've, that, that you're ignoring the family and after a while, the family won't put up that anymore. They want somebody actually doing things with them. Uh, relationships break down. So as we think about our end in mind, we need to think about our various roles. We don't just have one role in life. Um, if you don't know where you're going, how will you know when you get there? So that's pretty much what Christensen said. How will you measure your life? What is success to you? Uh, and some people, as he was saying in his video, none of his none of his fellow graduates from Harvard master's program uh, set out to destroy their families. Nobody said, I'm married to this beautiful woman and uh, we're going to have a bunch of kids and then she's going to divorce me and, and let somebody else help raise my kids. Nobody started out with that end in mind. But that's the end they achieved. Whether they, you know, so it doesn't always matter what, what end you have. I mean, what, it doesn't matter, they say, yeah, if you don't have that end in mind, then obviously the consequences are, they take on a shape of their own, let me put it that way. Uh, principles, a violation of principles, is one thing he says, lead to their own consequence. And you can't, you know, if you continue to violate certain principles, and that's where we start talking about, you know, those those lighthouse principles that we can't change. Um, if we don't uh, pay attention, uh, we don't, if we don't, if we're not supportive of our spouses or whatever, that's, that relation is going to break down. Even if we don't want it to, it will break down. Um, so those principles that we were talking about uh, help support all relationships, uh, business relationships, spousal relationships, family relationships. If we keep the principles, we keep those relationships strong. Uh, if we don't keep the principles, they have their own consequence that we didn't intend, but it occurred anyway. So there's, uh, again, two, two concepts that are not the same. We think of them sometimes as the same, leadership and management, uh, the, the two creations. So he's saying leadership is, is the mental creation. That's leadership. We decide what we're going to build, uh, so to speak. We decide which direction we're going to point that road as we start building it. Uh, but the other part, then management, is the physical. And so that's, in, in Dr. Covey speak, that's, that's habit three, basically. Um, habit three and, and beyond, actually, a, a lot of the stuff beyond habit two are part of the physical creation, I would say. So, but habit, at habit two, we are creating our future uh, mentally, spiritually, however, whatever. And then beyond that, we start creating uh, and even concluding proactivity, habit one, is all part of the physical creation. There's something I was gonna, thinking about that I wanted to share here and I'm trying to think of what it was. I'll come back to it, hopefully. 
So uh, this is kind of even hard to see what that's supposed to be. That, that's supposed to be a, a puzzle. And so you have those pieces of puzzle. And now I tell you, put that together. Uh, if you don't know what the puzzle's of, it's very hard. I don't know if you've seen them, but they're now puzzles that are just white. So you have no idea what it is, but you have to piece them together. That's the, the ultimate puzzle challenge. There's a whole bunch of pieces and add, there's no picture at all on it. You have to put it together only by the shape. Um, and so that could be even harder than this. But here are all the pieces. They're all scrambled up and you don't know what you're putting together. And that's kind of you know, managing without leadership. That's, that's kind of uh, building the road without knowing where you're going to. And so if you know that, that's, that the puzzle looks like this, now, you, now you're going to be much uh, more effective as you try to put it together. So you need the vision in order to create whatever you're to create your future. Uh, So before you figure out the end, you have to take a look at what you want. What is it you want? And again, looking at your different roles, um, that's one of the most important questions you'll ever ask yourself. What do I want out of life? Uh, he suggested exercise. Uh, there's one on the slide that uh, would be one way, but one of them he talks about in his book is that you 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 see yourself walking into a church. And of course, this is um, his perspective is a Christian perspective. And so not you know, all religions are, would experience what he talks about in this case. But you're going into a church, and in, at least in some churches, uh, most Christian churches, they allow, um, it's not required, but they at least allow the families to have what they call open casket. And so you can go up and see the person who's dead and kind of give them a final farewell, so to speak. Um, and they embalm them and they prepare them so they don't smell bad or something like that. They go through the, the scientific part. So you, they look as natural as possible for that last look at them. And so anyway, in this uh, story, anyway, this uh, exercise, you are going up the steps of this church to the funeral and you're kind of standing in line as people go up to pay their last respect to the person in the coffin, the person who's died. And so uh, people are talking to each other quietly and respectfully and one by one going to see the person in the coffin. And you get up there and look into the coffin and it's you. Um, and they proceed with the funeral. Your family talks about you. Your business uh, associates talk about you. Um, you know, your friends, your neighbors talk about you. And the question is, what do you want them to say? What would you like to hear as you're sitting there? You didn't realize you're dead yet, I guess. You're a ghost sitting there in the front, in the front row, listening to everybody talk about you. What would you like them to say? Um, That's more or less telling yourself, what is my end in mind? There's your end. Is it going to end the way you had in mind, so to speak? Um, it, it might be good, you know, one of the exercises he suggests is that you write your obituary. In other words, that you, you write what people might write about you when you're done with this life. Uh, another way of looking at it, uh, Another exercise you sometimes do, and this may be more international, is, uh, and you can put a time frame on it. In this case, uh, they're suggesting a 10-year time frame. So here you are, on, are in college, you're 19 or 20 years old. Um, 10 years from now, the newspaper reporter comes and uh, wants to do a story about you. Uh, what's going to be in that newspaper story? What are they going to say about you in 10 years? Or maybe you think 20 years or 30 years or like me, 50 years. I'm 50 years older than most of you. Uh, what do I want people to say about me when I fall over and <laughs> whatever, you know, in that uh, previous uh, uh, exercise? So um, somehow I'll tell you this. Those 50 years went by real fast. Um, when I was your age, I thought, well, I've got all the time in the world 
to do everything I want to do. And here I am at 69 years old and I don't have that much time left. And I don't know how much health I'll have left. Now, now I'm very healthy. Um, I'm, I'm in a, I'm very happy with, with where I'm at right now, doing what I'm doing with the health I have. But people start declining about my age or, or sooner. Their health starts going. Now they can't do. You know, now if you're saying, you know, what do I want to do with the rest of my life? There are limits to what you can do. Um, and the older you get, the more those limits, the, the, the more those limits uh, or the greater those limits are. Now, that said, there are a lot of people, there have been authors, uh, book authors who have not become famous until they're like 80 years old or something. So as a writer, I can still become famous if that's what I want to be or whatever my goal is. I still have maybe another 10 years to do something. Um, and I'm, I'm obviously, I, I mentioned before, I have no intention on retiring. I always have things I want to do. As long as I have health, I'm going to keep at it, whether it's teaching or writing or developing a new business or, or whatever it might be. But I'm just telling you, I don't really, I don't know where those 50 years went. We, we think at your age, we think that's a long time. At my age, I think that wasn't very long. Uh, that went by real fast. So don't fool yourself. It's a kind of an, uh, an illusion that you think that life is long. It isn't that long. Uh, we talked about Victor Frankl last, last week. He was the kind of the in promoter of, uh, of the idea of proactivity. Um, I found out he wasn't German, he was Austrian, but Germany controlled Austria. So he was an Austrian psychiatrist and neurologist. Psychiatrist is a combination. He's that you have to be a medical doctor and a psychiatrist, basically, that may, or a psychologist. A psychologist and medical doctor makes you a psychiatrist, basically. So he was a psychiatrist and neurologist, um, a professor, uh, but he was in Austria, which was controlled by Germany. Anyway, one of the uh, things he said, our life mission is more detected or discovered than invented. What do you think he meant by that? Now, we just said, uh, you know, uh, yeah, uh, The, uh, in the previous quote, we, we uh, said, you know, he said that we should, Drucker said that we should invent our future. And that's true, that we do invent it. That, that's a true way of looking at it. But in another sense, I think what he's talking about is going back to what we talked about the first day for those that were here. Kind of like, uh, do you love what you're good at or are you good at what you love? Kind of question. Um, part of the, one of the very first questions you need to ask yourself perhaps is, uh, you know, would what would you do even if nobody paid you to do it? You know, what what is so meaningful to you? What is enjoyable enough and meaningful enough to you that you would do it without pay? Uh, I, I do lots of stuff without pay. Um, you know, I, I mentioned uh, this project I, I, I undertook in Kazakhstan uh, where a Peace Corps worker wanted me to help uh, set up a conference of non-government organizations and, and publish a book. And she only saw it as one year. And I said, um, I'll help you with this, but it's not a one-year project. You may be going back to America in one year, but this is too, too important an idea. We're going to try to keep it going. And so now I just got an email yesterday. They want me to make a video for their upcoming conference uh, in about three weeks uh, that they can show to everybody that comes to their conference. And and help uh, prepare their next book. And that was, so this is book 11, I think, and conference 11. And uh, they've, you know, we've secured over those 11 years uh, about $10 million in funding. I didn't get into that money. <laughs> um, but it's something I would do without being paid because I felt I, it's something I feel like I need to do. I feel like it's something good that I can leave this world a little bit better. And so what would you do without being paid? That may help you. In this case, this isn't my, not directly my career, but it is a career I might, I could have pursued because it's something that I, I do that my heart feels good about it. Um, but actually being a professor, in a sense, allows me to do that sort of stuff on the side. 
And so that's one reason why I did uh, choose after I sold my last newspaper to become a professor again, because I saw the potential of, of doing things like that on the side, having more time to be involved with the community, be having more time to write books, have more time to do things significant, not just teaching, that which is significant. Um, I just got a, uh, a text from a student I taught, one of my first students I taught, who's now married to an American, living in America, and she was trying to, her husband's coming to Malaysia, and she wants me to host him and take him out to dinner or whatever and help him uh, while he's here. Well, that's, you know, those relationships are really meaningful to me. Uh, I had, I mean, like I say, she was, I haven't seen her for ages, and now to have that reconnection and get to know her family and so forth is, is, is valuable to me, uh, is rewarding. So anyway, um, so in a sense, it's both, I'd say. We, we first off had to figure it out. What is it? What is our end of mind? That's, in a sense, a discovery. And then once you discover what is your end, now the inventing is perhaps the physical part of it. Uh, so it's a little bit of both. Although inventing also, before you invent, uh, if you invent, you know, something mechanical, I have a couple of friends who are, are inventors and have made uh, a living off of, inventing, of, off of inventing stuff. And they've really loved that. I could imagine doing that. That's something I would enjoy, but not the path I took. Uh, but uh, uh, it's been very rewarding for them. And obviously they have to create it in their mind. They have to think about it uh, before they can actually create it physically too. But so it's a, anyway, you get the idea. It's, words, are do not, words do not always capture exactly the essence of what, we, what we're talking about. But in a sense, we do have to look into ourselves and to some degree that is a discovery. Discovering who you are what you want to be. Um, and then with that, um, as being part of your uh, mental uh, invention of yourself, now you proceed with the, the physical invention. Uh, Dr. Frankel also said uh, in, by his picture there, when we are no longer able to change a situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. So that reflects back on the first habit of uh, being proactive. We don't control everything. We do control our response to everything, uh, as much as to the degree we will accept it and can do it. So well, that's the question I just uh, posed to you. What would you do in life even if you were not paid to do it? One of those questions uh, in, in discovering who you are, discovering what uh, your path is. And then live out your imagination, not your history. Uh, we'll probably come back to this. In fact, I probably will, because um, that's one of the last things I want to talk about is is our mental, the power of our mental computer and how we can use it to accomplish what we want to accomplish. But uh, I'll mention here that uh, uh, the importance of dreams. Did you know that if uh, they did an experiment where they had people go to sleep and then they, they hooked up electrodes to them. And whenever they could tell from the electrodes uh, they started to dream, they woke them up. And then they let them go back to sleep again. And then when they saw that they were dreaming, they woke them up. And they did that throughout the night for a couple of different nights. By day three, they began hallucinating and seeing things that weren't there in the daytime when they were awake. Um, there's something about, uh, particularly our right brain, that needs, you know, right hemisphere of our brain that needs to dream. Uh, they, they concluded that you would actually die if you could not dream. Why? How, how does that work in? You know, I don't know. Well, they don't really know. Well, how is it you would die from not allowing yourself to dream? And so dreaming is actually becomes an important part of our living. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as, uh, as we conclude uh, later. But um, so thus the, the quote at the bottom of this page, live out your imagination, not your history, is good advice uh, and somewhat essential advice, recognizing how important our dreams are. And we can make them, in a sense, more important, and we'll come back to that too. It's important to understand that at any point in our life, 
at your age, at my age, it doesn't really matter. At any point in our life, now we may have some limitations, but we can choose to re-script our lives. We, in other words, we write a new script. We're part of a movie. And at any point, we can stop the movie, stop, rewrite, and we can start rewriting. We can't rewrite what's already done. That's already done. But we can rewrite what starts here and goes on. And if we don't like the way our movie is turning out, we should just stop it and rewrite. This is what I want to do. Uh, I screwed up this last part. Uh, from here, I'm going to rewrite and, and do, do what I think I, I really should be doing now, whatever that is. Uh, so two additional unique human endowments that enable us to expand our proactivity and to exercise personal leadership is imagination and conscience. So as we start looking at, uh, going back again, looking at proactivity, it's that space, you know, that imagination and conscience that allows us to determine, you know, to be uh, proactive instead of reactive. Uh, those are two of the important things that, 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 that exist in that in between there. We no longer accept what people tell us that we need to be. We don't accept uh, what people are trying to force us to be. We don't accept what our natural instincts would cause us to do. But in there, using our imagination and our conscience, um, we decide. And sometimes the reason why it has to be a habit is because sometimes that space between the stimulus and the response is a matter of seconds, even microsecond, less than a second. You have to decide, here's the stimulus, what am I going to do to respond? If, it had, if it's not a habit, then you're, you may very well respond not the way you wanted to. You know, you've made, it, you've made your decision, you want to respond in a more positive way or whatever, but you haven't made it a habit yet. And so, bam, you go off and you go pick up old habits. The old habits that you developed growing up or, or whatever, uh, you, go, you resort to the old habits because you have not ingrained yet the new habits. So that's, again, a reason why Covey says it has to be a habit. Uh, because you have so little time to decide stimulus response, you know, less than a second frequently, a few seconds maybe in many cases. Now, one thing that Dr. Covey's become famous for, uh, you may have heard, of, you know, the companies uh, create mission statements. Uh, that's, again, not a new term, but it became famous because of Dr. Covey. And so now many, many different companies uh, create their own mission statement. Uh, many organizations, hospitals, I mean, you name the organization, many of them have built their own mission statement because of Dr. Covey. Uh, he's the one that kind of, again, it's not, he didn't invent the word, but before Dr. Covey, nobody was talking about doing it. But he made it so famous that everybody now says, oh yeah, we need a mission statement. I was just at a business meeting yesterday for a new business I'm helping out with. Oh yeah, we need a mission statement. <laughs> Uh, that was, uh, that's the first thing a lot of people think of as they're building a new business. Oops, mission statement. What are we all about? What is our business all about? What do we want to accomplish as a business? We're gathering here a group of, of, uh, in, of uh, founders of an organization. What are we all about? And uh, uh, so you create a mission statement to, to suggest uh, what, your, what the role is of your organization or the roles. Um, nowadays, we talk a, a lot about corporate social responsibility. So that could be incorporated into a business uh, mission statement. What do you do to make money? What do you do to serve the community? Uh, that sort of uh, uh, idea could be reflected in your mission statement. But Dr. Covey says that actually we as individuals should have a mission statement. What am I all about? And as we start building, a, a, a creating a family, it's not a bad thing to have a family mission statement. What are we all about? And raise your children in this environment that we, our family is about this. Our family is about service. Our family is about, uh, you know, holding on to the principles uh, that Dr. Covey teaches, for example. That you set your, your mission statement for your family not individually, as a family you do it, and as children are growing up, they may not participate in that. But uh, it is important that 
that the people involved in an organization also be involved in the mission statement and other goals related to that mission statement. Um, otherwise, it's not theirs. And we'll come back to that idea in a little bit as well. So individually, if it's your own mission statement, then you're on your own. Uh, but as you start building mission statements for organizations that you're part of, your family, your business, and so forth, now you start seeking synergy with other people, involvement and, and co-creation with other people that are impacted by it. And you decide, you know, what are we all about instead of what, what am I all about? Uh, so the mission statement uh, does uh, include some philosophy, some creed, uh, typically, uh, because that's it's reflective of your values. Uh, it focuses on what you want to be. That's your character. So again, it kind of reflects on the habits you're going to develop. Uh, there are institutional habits as well as individual habits, by the way. Uh, you, you build an institutional culture. You might call it a culture instead of habit, but it's still the same thing, actually. A culture is um, it, is also kind of a composite of habits, but it's a habit that kind of you, you build an environment of habits that you that er, that most everybody adopts, and we call it a culture. And so you build a culture or a set of habits also within a, 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 an organization. And your mission statement can reflect uh, that uh, those those philosophies, those creeds, the character you want to to Im implement and to de to develop as a group, um, and also what you want to do, the contributions you want to make, the achievements you want to want to make, um, and the values and principles upon which these are going to be based. So do you base them on you know, true principles, as Dr. Covey uh, might refer to them, um, things that you believe are eternal in nature that, uh, uh, like I say, are just as much uh, as eternal as the law of gravity, so to speak. If you do these things, uh, you'll do well. If you don't do these things, you're going to have some bad natural consequences. If you want to reject the law of gravity and jump off a cliff, well, your rejection of it doesn't change it. Uh, it's a bad outcome. And what basically he's saying is the principles he talks about are the same thing. You can break them if you want to, but there are negative consequences if you do. Uh, these are these are eternal principles as, as much so as the law of gravity. Um, he suggests that we are not human beings on a spiritual journey, but spiritual be beings on a human journey. That may reflect somewhat his uh, religion, but uh, I know that author of a textbook we use uh, in our uh, history of media course in in, uh, in journalism. Uh, the author looks at spirituality uh, not in a religious perspective, although he obviously acknowledges that it can relate to a religion. But he says it's kind of the way. If you remember the gal who talked about the four pillars of. Uh, uh, she, she didn't call it happiness, but more or less, she was saying four pillars of happiness, although she was saying that the pursuit of happiness leads to unhappiness, which doesn't, uh, that would suggest that they're not pursuing happiness properly. If you're, do, if you're pursuing the four pillars she talked about from a scientific perspective, she was saying, more or less, these are true principles. And if you t compared her four principles that she found scientifically and compared them to Dr. Covey's, that maybe reflect somewhat his his philosophy and not uh, necessarily science. They are very much over. They very much overlap. So one of the things she talks about, if you remember, one of the four was uh, something transcendent, something that you think is bigger than you. Now that may reflect a religion. It may also just it may reflect reflect uh, you may be an environmentalist and reflect and it may reflect your love for nature or something. But something that's bigger than you that that you might die for uh, because it's so important to you. So you know that's how she expressed it was something something transcendent that people to be happy need something transcendent, something bigger than themselves. Um, the other thing she talked about was kind of those social relations, which Dr. Covey would agree with. Uh, she said, uh, "I see this, one of the, one of them was how you tell your story, which is kind of." 
you know, um, kind of rewriting the script for how you're going to write your script. You see, that's important how you tell yourself the story. Um, not to deceive yourself, but uh, that's where she was talking about uh, the person who, um, I'm not sure if he's in the military or whatever, but anyway, became disabled. And um, maybe it was in sports, I don't remember. But anyway, he, he, he became paralyzed, but he actually said that that, be, that was something that allowed him to to be less selfish and less, you know, to be more effective in touching the lives of others. And he found greater meaning in life because after he was paralyzed. Uh, so there's something bigger than himself um, that was also related to social relations and so forth. Um, but that was also rewriting, she said, was rewriting his story. You know, he was an athlete. Now he's not an athlete. So he had to rewrite his story to find meaning in life. Uh, so it is more or less rescripting. Now, it, in that case, he had to rescript. Now, in meaning in life, he could no longer look at his body and say, I am one of the tough guys. Because he was paralyzed. And so now he had to find a new script. Um, let me, before I go into this, uh, let me, I want to watch the uh, first of the, uh, well, actually, I think I'll watch, we'll watch two videos, uh, Zig Ziglar and, uh, and the first uh, of the Tony Robbins. Uh, let me find, well, let me see. Let me pick them up from there. I'm going to stop the uh, my video. Okay, so we started talking about uh, first off what uh, uh, Tony Robbins was talking about again um, up here in the board, which uh, you can't see. Uh, the RPM results, purpose, and M is massive action plan uh, or map. Uh, that is, you know, all of that is, should do, to some degree be incorporated in your in your mission statement. Um, words don't always uh, exactly. So this is one way to look at that. But the message is the same thing. One aspect that maybe this has to the idea of a mission plan is uh, what what I call stepping stone goals. Um, I mentioned, I think maybe before, one of my jobs uh, before I came came to Asia was to work with migrant students in America. Migrant students are the least, um, well, what's the right word? They do the worst in public schools, uh, partly because they're poor, partly because they many of them speak a different language. They don't speak English yet. Um, partly is, is because they're because their families are poor. Uh, they might be, you know, a family of six, maybe living in a car or at least some very bad environment. Uh, they don't have computers, probably, you know, in many cases. They just, it's just, and they, they, by the very definition, being migrant, they are moving from area to area to harvest crops or whatever. And so they don't build friendships. They don't build a support system. They don't know the teachers. And even when they go, when they go to another school in America, we don't have just one curriculum for all the schools. So one school, they might be taking certain classes at one school, they move to another school, they don't even offer those classes. And if they do, they're using a different textbook. And so suddenly, what, do, what are they supposed to do with those students who walk in mid-semester and you know, they, they, took, they were taking different classes and stuff? So it's, the whole system is not made well for migrant students. And so consequently, half of all migrant students quit before they get done with school, with public school. Uh, but if they come to what we call the, the migrant leadership program, um, then, uh, or leadership development program, I guess it is. Anyway, they uh, change that percentage from half of them uh, graduating and, and had to 80% of them graduating. So they increase their chances of graduating by 60% if they spend three days with us. And in those three days, they're basically doing this sort of stuff. And, and they're also being explained, you know, they, we talk to them about how they can get, you know, from, you know, from this point to this point. You know, this is their goal, this is where they are. Uh, so how do we get from here to there? 
in your mind, Stephen, you don't see any way to get there. And so we have to explain to them that there are ways to get there. It will take a lot of work, uh, but others have done it. Uh, many migrant students have done it. Uh, and so we explain how it's done and they start making plans and so forth. And so suddenly in three days, they change their odds, adds, odds of graduating uh, by 60%, more of them will, will graduate. And many of those will go to college because now they, they understand how they can get there. And they set plans for getting there. Anyway, one of the process we teach us uh, at that uh, uh, student leadership uh, camp is what we call stepping stone goals. And so if you can imagine uh, you are on one side of a river. It's not a real deep river, but it's, uh, it's wide. Uh, you know, let's say, you know, 20 or 20 meters wide or something. Are you going to be able to jump across that river? No. Uh, nobody can jump that far. So how do you get across the other side without getting your feet wet? Well, you can start by go finding a big rock and you go out the side of the river and drop in the river. And if it's again, the water's not too deep, there you can step on that rock. You go back and get another rock. And you just go out the first rock, you drop the second rock. You go back and get another one. You go across the first few rocks, you drop down the third rock. And eventually you get across that river uh, using stepping stones, what we call stepping stones, without getting your feet wet. And so stepping stone goals, uh, I'd say, are kind of similar to the massive action plan. You know, just setting the end goal is not going to get you there because that's, that's jumping the 20 meters or whatever. You, you, you can't do that. And if you're a migrant student or somebody, you know, somebody who faces challenges, which, gee, who faces challenges in this world? Uh, everybody does, right? So if, if you are standing here and you want to get there, and this is a long-term goal, if you haven't thought about the stepping stone goals, you, you, you might give up also. So that's where you need the massive action plan. Massive in the sense of being a big plan, yes, but I think also massive in the sense of of having stepping stone goals, of knowing how you're going to get from here to there. Because if you can't see the stepping stones, that's also can lead to discouragement and failure because you don't believe you can get there. You don't see it. You just, you know, you can't jump those 20 meters. And so you say, I can't jump 20 meters, I give up. Uh, when what you do need are some stepping stones. That's what you need. And so that's part, to me, part of the, the, the massive action plan is setting, figuring out what the stepping stones are. And truth is, if you're talking about a massive action, you know, your, your ultimate goal is 20 years from now, you can't set exact stepping stones, but you can start setting some stepping stones. And just making some of those stepping stones will help you to believe you will be able to make more stepping stones after that. Okay, you may not see every stone you need to put in, every goal, you know, sub goal, you can say, that you need from here to there. But you, you can start setting some, some major goals and start going that direction. So uh, I think uh, that's important. And then what uh, Zig Ziglar was talking about, again, um, that goes back to looking at everything, making sure your ultimate goal is what you really want. Again, we've had several people, Covey, Christensen, Zig Ziglar, they make sure when you're talking about your end goal, your big one, your mission, that you have included all the roles you want to include and that you've included all the elements of what is really success to you. Don't leave, don't leave some stuff out because, again, you could be like the, you know, the guys who get the Harvard degrees and they go and they're, they're immediately swooped up by big businesses and they immediately go in and go to work and they haven't looked at, you know, they haven't considered all their roles, all those other uh, goals they, they want to achieve. And just like Clayton Christians was saying, they end up, you know, not, they end up destroying their families or whatever because they are going against those eternal principles that do lead to happiness because they haven't figured it all out. All they say, saw was, Harvard, here I go, world. I'm going to be successful because I have this Harvard master's degree. 
everybody with this Harvard master's degree is successful, and most of them are successful in business. They're, they're successful in a career. It doesn't mean they're successful in everything. They haven't thought it all through. And so make sure that, that you're going where you really want to go, and that includes your different roles, not just your business uh, role. Now, one thing, and as we talk about that, see, we're running out of time, so I need to hurry. Um, Dr. Covey says, he asked the question, well, he, he says that, that, that what we center our lives around provides us security, our sense of security, our sense of guidance, our sense of power, our sense of wisdom. These things emanate out from what we have put into the center of our lives. Um, now, as I told you, uh, I believe Dr. Covey had 10 kids. Dr. Covey had a wonderful wife. Dr. Covey had lots of roles. He was, uh, you know, a professor at a at, at the university that uh, Forbes magazine just, just just declared the best buy in America, Brigham Young University. Um, he was an author. He was a speaker. I mean, he had all these roles. Um, how could he do it all? What, what was, and what was the center of his life? Uh, you might think with 10 kids that it might be his family. But he said, no, that if you make it your family, you might be in trouble. Now, in his case, his family was, you know, was amazing and it, it might have worked out fine. He's saying, what happens if it's your spouse and family, for example, and something happens, tragic? Uh, what happens if your wife does leave you? What happens if she dies uh, unexpectedly? You know, what, what, you know, what, what happens to you now if you've made your wife, for example, your spouse, the center of your life, and that spouse dies? Where do you go from there? You just lost the center of your life. And so he, he suggests a number of different alternative centers, um, your spouse, family, money, work, possessions, pleasure, friends or enemies, church, yourself. He says, actually, none of those are right. Uh, some people might say, well, church, church, church. You know, if church is really important to you. And, and church isn't a bad thing. We say, no, not even church, not even family, not even spouse. None of those are the right center. Um, you know, we could discuss that in a lot of detail, and I do have to rush along. He says the center is the principles. If you live, if the center of your life are those eternal principles, then the, everything else will come together. That if that the principles are the center of your of, of your power, if they lead to your power and your your motivation and and so forth, then you will have a good family probably. Your spouse will probably be happy with you, and you have a good relationship with your spouse. You will probably be good at business. Um, you'll be an executive that people want to work for because you are principle-centered. And those principles include things like recognizing that your employees or your spouse or your children uh, have great potential, and you'll want to help them develop their potential because uh, one of the eternal principles uh, is service. And so you'll be service-oriented. And so if you... Uh, go back to those eternal principles of potential and service and integrity. Uh, people can trust you because they know when you say something, you're going to do it and so forth. If you go back to these eternal principles that he talked about in, uh, earlier, uh, I think two weeks ago, those principles will help you secure all of these things, all of the other worthy things anyway. Maybe not pleasure. I mean, pleasure would... Like I say, I, in my definition, there's something above pleasure. I think happiness is above pleasure. Pleasure is something my son gets with his video games. Happiness is what you get when you, you know, have a nice home, you pay it off, you have kids, you have a good wife, you know, you things are together, you, you're making enough money, all the things basically that Zig Ziglar is talking about in his, in his list of things uh, that make you really successful, um, that is the sort of thing, those things you can achieve by being, by seeing people's potential, by being service-oriented, by being uh, 
honorable and, and, and have integrity that people can trust you and all those things that he was talking about. So, so again, we want to, uh, if we put principles in the center, then we have a greater sense of wisdom because we're basing our wisdom on principles. We have a, a secure guidance, what will get us to where we want to go because we're basing it on secure principles. We'll have a sense of security in the sense of we know uh, how, it, we know our place in the eternity, so to speak. We are firm on, on what we believe and, and value. And we gain a power from that. We gain power by, by respecting other people, by seeing their potential, by helping them achieve what they need to achieve at the same time that they're helping us as well be more effective and happier because we, as we go on with Covey's other uh, habits, we realize, as he says, basically, if you, if you adopt the first three, be proactive, uh, begin with the end of mind, putting first things first, that's only, you're, you're less than halfway there because the other three deal with other people. The, the first three deal with becoming independent. The next three become interdependent. How do you achieve success with other people? So those next three are really important uh, in achieving greater success and greater happiness uh, because other we, we aren't happy just by ourselves. Uh, we need something more than just ourselves. Um, so Oliver Wendell Holmes was a, a chief justice in the American Supreme Court and somebody seen as one of the most wise people in American history. What lies behind us and what lies before us are tiny matters compared to what lies within us. And you can say, in this case, those are the principles. If we have integrity and if we have, you know, if we're basing our lives on the principles, then our past and our present uh, won't be nearly as important because we have a future. We will build the future on our, on our eternal principles. Now, I, I promise to come back to the idea of uh, the brain, and I'm going to try to get, uh, to get to a little bit of that video that I was talking about. I may just have to explain it to you and let you watch the, uh, the other Tony Robbins video yourselves. But you know we have two hemispheres, and one is kind of the logical, mathematical side, and one is the, the creative side, the intuitive side, uh, deals in more pictures. Uh, it's more holistic, it, uh, more in synthesis. Whereas, again, the, the left side uh, is more analytical, more sequential. And both of these parts are important for our success. Um, I mentioned the importance of dreaming. That would be right, right brain. But even in, a, in addressing that, there are ways to tap in to your right brain uh, in a logical way, actually. So you can kind of combine the two. Um, we are the creative force of our life and through our own decisions rather than our conditions, uh, if we carefully learn to do certain things, we can accomplish those, those goals. So how we implement the tools we have, and one of those certainly is our brain, uh, is one of the most important. Uh, so as we, oops, here we go again. There we go. Okay, so uh, using the power of imagination, um, you know, one of the sayings that frequently goes around, if you can dream it, you can achieve it. In other words, if you can imagine it, you can do it. Uh, now that isn't universal. You know, you know, I'm not gonna be, if I can imagine it right now, I am not going to be a superstar basketball player. We can pretty much bet on that, right? And so there, there are certain caveats to that, that saying. But if you can't dream it, you can't achieve it. If you can dream it, you have a chance, if it's reasonable. <laughs> you have to understand yourself as well and your, your assets. What do you bring to the table? I don't bring enough to the table to become, become a star basketball player, uh, especially at my age. And so that's not one of my goals. Uh, but I can set goals uh, based on the strengths I do have. And I can accomplish those. I accomplish things, again, that I can't even at the time imagine. You know, going back to the, this program I set up in, in Kazakhstan, I did not imagine that we'd be getting $10 million in funding and that, that the 
that with that funding, we expand, would expand from Kazakhstan to eight different countries around Central Asia. I, I did not imagine that. Uh, so that's kind of maybe down here where I could imagine a little ways in the future. I was committed to the idea that this is a good enough program. We should pursue it long term. How successful would it be? I did not have any grasp that we could do that. Um, but I did understand the importance and, and was willing to commit the effort to try to go as far as we could take it. Um, one of the things he says is visualization is important. And this, the, la the other video I would like to show, but I may just tell you about it for now, is uh, Tony Robbins talks about the power of visualization and the importance of visualization. Um, you can expand your mind, challenge your mind. Part of that is lifelong learning. But part of it is, even in that lifelong learning, I, I one of the reasons why I like to watch videos about, uh, you know, about quantum physics is that it forces my mind to consider other options. Uh, even if I end up disagreeing, even if I think there's no way we're a video game, you know, I, I don't believe that. Uh, nonetheless, the very ideas that they're, that they're feeding me, why they would even think that, help expand my mind. The very fact that they think that the phys uh, phys yeah. um, that the quantum physicists see so much mathematical perfection in the universe, yeah, that by itself expands my mind. What does that mean? How, you know, they're, they're basically saying this can't be by accident. It's too perfect. Uh, the physics are too perfect. The math is too perfect. So what you know that by itself expands my mind. Even if I disagree with how what they where they take it, or where some of them take it, or at least one of them, some of them think about it anyway, I think they've gone too far. But it still um, expands my mind. Uh, in in visualization, he suggests that you involve many as many emotions and feelings as you can. If I wanted to be, uh, you know, if I really wanted to write the, you know, a book that would make me really famous or whatever, uh, maybe imagining myself getting the Nobel Prize in literature and uh, imagining what it feel like for them to announce uh, that, that I won it, to go up and get my million dollar check, to uh, hear the applause of the people, uh, you know, it, it sense that as much as I can, what it would be like to do that, if that were my goal. Um, so you involve as many emotions and feelings as you can, as many senses as you can, in essence. You are smelling it, you're seeing it, you're hearing it. You are visualizing it as perfectly as you can. Now, one of the things that he says, and the Tony Robbins video that we probably won't get to, uh, what he says is that that's one of the key things you do with visualization is make yourself, is make your vision a reality. Envision it so often and so in such detail that you're comfortable with it. You're comfortable. Sometimes we are not comfortable with success. We cannot envision ourselves achieving that success. I mean, we maybe dream it, but we doubt it. We don't really think, we really don't think we can get from here to here. We dream about it, but we really don't think we can get from here to here. We don't believe ourselves. Uh, and so in doubting it, uh, let me give another Tony Robbins here. Um, he, uh, let's put over here. Um, he, he, uh, If we don't really believe very much in the kind of goal, if we really don't believe, then we're going to question our potential to do it. We're saying, I don't know if I can get there. That's 
What Covey's saying, what he's saying is, it can you can make that happen by visualization. You become comfortable with the vision of you succeeding and the actions you take to succeed. You're smelling them, hearing them, seeing them in your mind, and now you're comfortable with that success, with achieving it, and you believe it enough that now you are, you do believe in your potential, and you do take massive action, and you do achieve good results, and you now increase your belief, which leads to the positive circle. Um, he uh, he talks about a uh, a study that was done, and uh, it was uh, they they took basketball players uh, to do this study, and they divided a bunch of basketball players into uh, three groups. Uh, I may have mentioned this before, but I'm going to reiterate it because it's part of this video. Um, and one of the groups was they did nothing. Okay, so that that was kind of their control group. So okay, they, what what happens if they do nothing? Uh, the other group, they had them go practice every day for an hour or something. I don't know how long, um, and just practice making free uh, what we call free throws. In basketball, if you get fouled, you get to shoot a, a, a free shot, uh, and it's worth one point. Um, sometimes you get to shoot two shots, and so depending on, on the situation. Uh, sometimes it's one and one. If you make the first one, you get to make a second. That doesn't really matter. The point is that it becomes a very important part of basketball is to be able to shoot free throws. When nobody's trying to block you, they're standing on the side, you have a, a, a straight line to your basket, can you put that basket <coughs> through the, the hoop. Uh, and those who can uh, tend to be better at other things too. Um, and so the third group did not practice. So the second group practiced for an hour or so every day, shooting, 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 shooting. The third group practiced in their mind every day for one hour. And they did it with perfection. Every time they shot, went through. Uh, in their mind, they were perfect for an hour every day, imagining shot after shot after shot. Um, there is, for those who follow basketball, there are people who definitely, what we say, the word we use is choke. Uh, they might be able to shoot a jump shot, but when they get to that free throw line, they choke, and they, they kind of get a little scared or something, everybody's looking at them, and they can't shoot free throws. Um, and so this is an important thing for people to learn is if you're going to play basketball is how to shoot those dependably. Uh, there's people like, uh, um, uh, what's his name? <laughs> Steph Curry, in all of his, you know, he's gone to the playoffs for like uh, six years straight, something like that seven years straight, and he's only, in, in the whole time he's been shooting three free throws in the playoffs, the National Basketball League uh, playoffs, he's only missed one time in the in the fourth quarter, anyway. maybe it's stipulated fourth quarter. But when he needs to, he does never, he never misses. Other people never make it, basically. Uh, but he is the best in the world at that. 
So anyway, so the results of the experiment, well, well I wouldn't be telling you about it if, if you don't, you already know the answer. It was not the ones who actually practiced. It was those who actually practice in their minds. They became very comfortable. They, they stopped choking, perhaps. You know, what, what is it about in visualizing it that allowed them to do better than those who actually physically practiced? I don't know that we totally understand the answer to that. Uh, but part of it, what Covey suggests and what, uh, what Tony Robbins suggests is that it's, it's the belief. That now you've done it so much for a whole month or two months, whatever it was, you're so comfortable in this case making all every basket. You are now Steph Curry. You don't miss, and you're comfortable with that, and you don't miss. Uh, that or at least you do a lot better because you have changed this. Because uh, you didn't physically do it. But in your mind, you did it. Um, he uh, he does an experiment. Uh, when you watch it, uh, I'll let you watch the video. We're not going to get to it. Uh, I would suggest if you you should watch maybe at least the first half of it. Um, it's a fairly long video, but if you watch half of it, you'll you'll get the key points and be able to answer the questions on the quiz. Uh, part of it's right here. That's on the quiz. Um, the story is on the quiz. I think there's maybe one other thing that I'm not going to get to. But, uh, okay, so mentally, uh, you can get your brain involved in your reality. Uh, there's, uh, there was a, a famous uh, business consultant in America. He was like the president of the Business Consulting Association in America for many years. And he had a technique uh, where he would... Uh, at night, he would go study the problem. You know, that was his job, helping people solve their problem, helping businesses solve their problems. He'd go study their problems. And then he goes home at night and he programs his mind. He tells his brain, basically he's talking to his right brain in this case, his right hemisphere, here's the problem, solve the problem for me. And he just repeat it, repeats that to his brain. Solve this problem, tell me the answer. Solve the problem, solve the problem. And he programs his brain basically, you know, he, he like say before he goes to sleep, he, he tells his brain what he's, you know, the different problems and stuff. And he tells us he orders his brain to solve the problem. And he goes to sleep. And he wakes up with all these ideas and how to solve the problem. Um, I've done that and it's been uh, a very, I don't do it every night or anything because I don't have problems to solve every night. I'm not a business consultant. But um, I have done it, and, I, and waking up in the morning, I just the other day, I think less than a week ago, or almost exactly a week ago, I came up with a whole new business plan. Uh, that is, yeah, I'm excited to do it. I don't know if I, like I say, I get too many ideas. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it's good. It's very good. And I took like half an hour to write down the whole thing. Oh, yeah, here it is. Um, program your brain. You can test it in a little, little small way. Test, test it. If you, uh, you might set your alarm anyway, but you can actually order your brain to wake you up at a certain time. Your brain is aware of the time. Um, and so I, I've done this a number of times, especially if I have to wake up early. It's better, you'll feel more refreshed if your brain wakes you up than if an alarm wakes you up. So like if I had to get up at 4 in the morning, I'd tell my brain before I go to sleep, Wake me up at 4, wake me up at 4 a.m., wake me up at 4 a.m., wake me up at 4 a.m. I'd order my brain to wake me up so that, uh, like I said, I'd wake up more naturally than if I have the alarm, you know, whatever. Uh, and it'll wake you up. Your, your, your brain can be your alarm clock. It, it's aware of that stuff. You can program it. And so this guy takes it to the extreme to where he's ordering his brain to solve his business problems. Um, your brain and the you know, visualization is part of it. Your your programming of your brain is part of it. Uh, even some of this other stuff, where he's talking about expanding your brain, that's that's important. As you expand your brain, you are giving more material to your brain to be able to solve those problems when it comes down. And uh, like, well, in this guy, even himself, you know, he has to study the problem first. He has to understand the problem and tell his brain, okay, these are the problems. We need a result. We need an answer. How do we 
uh, handle these problems with, in a satisfactory way. Now set your right brain to work on it. And as I said, your right brain is working all night. That's when your right brain really goes crazy. You're not interfering with your right brain at night. Um, uh, and, and it's dreaming, it's doing, it's solving, it's doing stuff. And what all it's doing, we don't fully understand. Like I say, people will die if they can't do it. Um, but that right brain is, is a really important part uh, of getting past the 5 to 10% of your mental capability and pushing beyond that is programming your right brain to work for you. Okay. Well, let me think there, if there's something else in that uh, video I wanted to share or anything else before we call it quits. I think we pretty much covered most of the important stuff. So you do have a little more video to watch. But if, like I said, if you watch that second Tony Robbins, uh, half of it, um, that's all we watched in class last time. So maybe 15 minutes. Or, I think it's quite long, but I think, uh, let me see, where is it? Oops. Okay, the second one is 25 minutes long. So I think in class we watched like 15 minutes, and I think that's enough. If you're really into it, watch it all. Um, it's, uh, it's definitely Tony Robbins is a very good. I mean, he's multi-millionaire millionaire training trainer for a reason. Uh, very famous uh, in America. Uh, as you see, very expressive, and he has interesting interesting ideas to share. So, um, you know, listen to at least, I'd say, 15 minutes of that. And this uh, one, this TED.com one, is uh, talks about how one guy uh, basically used Covey's principle, beginning with the end in mind, to change his life, kind of rescripting his life. Um, and so that's a, a good story as well. And it's short. It's, uh, it's also, well, it's a little bit long, I guess. It's uh, 16 minutes. But uh, those are good. Okay, uh, any questions? Next week, uh, Group One is presenting. Who's Group One? You're too shy to admit it? Okay, well, whoever, whoever has Chapter One, you're up next week. And uh, I did send out today, uh, you may not have looked at your email yet, but I sent out an email uh, letting you know that I did a, a short video, I'm not sure, maybe 16 minutes or also, something like that about how to uh, get a good grade on your, on your presentation. I went through the, uh, the critique sheet and uh, talked about each one of those. So uh, you don't necessarily need to watch it this week. If you're not presenting for another few weeks, you can wait and watch it later if you want to. But it's there. It's under this week. I'll probably make a copy and put a copy into the very top of, the, of our, uh, of our uh, Moodle site. But right now it is under week uh, five, uh, so you can find that and understand. And some of you have already emailed me and said, you, you know, told me some good ideas and stuff. So I mine, mine is just the, the how, t what I was thinking when I set up the critique sheet, what, I'm, what it all means, what that critique sheet means. And you can go beyond it. You can do better than what I've suggested. But uh, anyway, why don't you understand what I was thinking as I, as I made, put that together? Okay, Any, anything else? Okay, well, start getting your end of mind. Okay, have a good weekend. Uh, where'd the uh, tennis sheet get? Thank you. Again, everybody uh, should be signing week one. So I don't want to count week one against you. And anyway, week one is on the Moodle. You actually had to watch week one anyway, so you watched the Moodle version of it anyway. So that's week one. The self-reflective, well, there's a, I went through it and did a video on it. But anyway, so. Because I'm not sure what Oh, you base it on? You base it on everything. Based on everything. But you don't have to. It's based on everything, but you don't have to talk about everything. So, like, if I give you eight videos, you might refer to in the in the journal to four of them. One thing I did say in class a couple of times was, don't ignore the long ones. Don't don't. Wow. If you say if you only watch the six yeah. minute ones, yeah. I'm going to kind of catch on to that. Yeah. But you didn't watch the other ones. Yeah. Or the video. Yeah. 
Yeah, but you don't have to talk about all of them because, like, if I give you, like, in this case, there's seven videos or eight videos if you count the music yeah, ones. There's too much. I know. I mean, you could talk to about more than one thing. I mean, I try to make it the first couple of weeks, they, we, they were kind of all over the place because there was kind of an overview of what we were doing in class. I'm trying to get them a little more related now. These ones, I think, are somewhat related to each other. But. So the, the further we go along, uh, well, I say that to a degree, while we're in coveys, I'm trying to relate them as much as possible. Once we get done with the covey, I relate them somewhat, but then they do start spreading out again. Like during the first couple of weeks, yeah. they were kind of spread out. The last couple of weeks, they'll be spread out a little bit too. Um, I'm not sure if opinion is the right I mean, opinion, because maybe, but what I'm really self-reflective suggest that you tell me how you think you can impl implement these ideas in your own life. Well, you can look backwards and say, you know, I had this problem. I had the, I uh, was always uh, having a hard time with kids in my school. Um, if I had understood these principles of Covey, you know, this and this and this, I could have, I could have uh, done a lot better uh, in my relationship with those other students. You know, so you tell me about the, so you're reflecting, you can go backwards, be now or be in the future. All of them. So it's self-reflective. So it can be about something that happened in the past, how you could have could have done better, something that you're doing right now, how you could improve your work here at uh, or your life here at, at Chima. Or it can be the future, how you want to implement the strategies uh, that we talked about that week with your family and with your career. So it just uh, how how you can or could have or will implement what you're learning in class in your own life. The what? Were you, were you here in the week when I was talking about how we get graded? Uh -huh. uh, a couple of weeks ago, or I don't know if it was last week or the week before, I was talking about how we grade overall. Uh -huh. That yeah. that I can only give, you know, 20 to 30 percent A's and A minus. Well, what I'm saying, what I'm trying to say right now, is that I I, can, I have to compare what you do to everybody else, whether I like it or not. Well, let me. Uh, let me do that for everybody. Uh, what I'll do is I will take some examples. I will post, uh, well, I will take actually from a previous semester. Oh, oh. And I will show you what an A looked like and what a B looked like and oh. so forth. Um, and so you get some idea. Of course, don't try copying them <laughs> because they're, they're in the, they're in the uh, turnitin.com database. So it would catch you really easy. So, yeah, exactly. so. But it'll give you some ideas of, of what I, you know, you can look at them and, and try to kind of get an idea of what I liked or didn't like. Um, it's not going to be perfect, but you'll get some idea. Um, and so I will post that. Um, I, I might do that today. It might be next week. I don't know. But I, I will give you, as soon as I can, I will go through and I, I think I put in last year's of course, I have to take names off so you don't know who wrote it and stuff. But uh, uh, I can put uh, you know, maybe, maybe four or so that gives you a range from really good to not so good uh, without names on them. And uh, you can take a look at them and hopefully kind of get some idea of what, yeah. Well, I mean, part of what I'm saying here is that I, I know a lot of people are going to be talking, to, you know, like, since I challenged them to, if you had eight videos, to talk about four of them. Uh, I would say quite a few people are going to do that, mm -hmm. and so, so uh, you know, I don't know. And I and I I'm trying. I did have told people that try not to. Uh, how do I say this? That I will try not to give too much advantage to those who write long, longer than required. Uh, and indeed, one of my examples I will post will be an A. Actually, my top grade last semester was less than 3,000 words, slightly, just slightly, like 2,900 or something. It wasn't so it wasn't so short that I penalized them for it. It was just very close. Mm -hmm. Whereas some other people also got A's and they put in like 8,000 words. You know, so they were way over, but they did it. I mean, but I didn't penalize them for going over. But um, if they had really done a bad, I think one person. Got a really bad grade because too much of his was plagiarized, and Turnitin.com showed me it was plagiarized. I mean, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't so much that I flunked him, but it was enough that I could not give him a good grade because of it. And so and his was quite long because it was really easy since he took it from other sources. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, so he took too much out, and so I didn't flunk him, but I think he got a he got about the lowest grade, even though he did 8,000 words. They weren't his all his words. So trying to evaluate well, how much is his and how much did he borrow, and how did he borrow it, you know, stuff like that. I, I did not flunk him, but he did not get a good good, good grade, even though he had 8,000 words. So um, words. Um, as I kind of told people, you might consider the extra words as extra credit in a sense, if you do well. But if you did a bad job anyway, well, then 8,000 words don't even add up to extra credit because the words, if they're bad, if they're not written well, if they're not expressing well, if they're just mm -hmm. words, just to throw in words, that doesn't get you a good grade. Mm -hmm. uh, if you, you know, if they're pretty good, if it's written pretty well and you've done a lot, yeah, that will influence it. Um, as long as I am pretty sure you didn't plagiarize or anything, and like they turn it in helps me to do that. Um, so the original, uh, like maybe somebody does 6,000 words and they have lots of bad grammar. That might be a case where, okay, I'm going to, you know, bad grammar, I'm not, I'm trying not to judge totally on bad grammar, you know, or not trying to, you know, bad grammar is only supposed to count for 10%. Of the grade, but if it's really, really bad, what can I say? It might influence me. If I, if it's so bad that I can't understand what they're trying to say, for example, hmm. and that is a case, and so, and I maybe, maybe should say it in that way. I need, I know I need to say it in my other class. I was thinking about that just yesterday. I try to ignore bad grammar to the great degree I can for people for whom English is not their first language. But if I can't even understand it. How can I grade something I can't understand? Mm -hmm. And so, if the grammar is so bad, if they haven't, you know, tried to use some online or or word uh, tools to help improve it, you know, go to Grammarly.com or whatever. If they have done, if they did, if they give me stuff I can't understand, I can't give it a good grade. You know what I mean? Yeah. So even though I say it's only 10%, well, but it can affect everything else. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, so anyway, going back to my example, so somebody has pretty bad grammar, but they have good ideas, and I, I can barely understand it. They have good ideas, and I can tell it's original because it's such bad grammar. <laughs> um, so maybe I give them a little bit of boost because they did write more, um, and they had original ideas. They didn't write very well, but, you know, so I mean... Uh, that's why I really can't, you know, even though I, even with those percentages I put up in there, mm -hmm. the truth is I'm human. And this is a creator product. Mm -hmm. And I'm judging a creator product and comparing everybody to everybody else. Mm -hmm. So it's not a perfect science. It can't be. Uh, it's just the nature of a creator product. It, it, can't, be sci it can't be scientific. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, so that's... Uh, what can I tell you? It's it's not it, it is hard to understand because of the very nature of the assignment. It's hard for everybody. But I will give I'll put some examples on Moodle and draw everybody's attention to to those examples so they can kind of get an idea of ones that I that I gave a good grade to and those that did not get such a good grade. Mm -hmm. And hopefully you can see the difference.